Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Europe Weekly. This week, all eyes were on the 70th UN General Assembly in New York. Syria, ISIS and the refugee crisis were in the spotlight, as well as a meeting between Obama and Putin. Syria, ISIS and the refugee crisis were in the spotlight, as well as a meeting between Obama and Putin. The Russian president underlined the differing views on how to end a conflict that has claimed at least 240,000 lives. Two days later, after receiving the green light from the Russian parliament, he started airstrikes on Syrian territory. Russia's defense ministry claims its warplanes have carried out about 20 flights over Syria, hitting eight ISIL targets in Moscow's most dramatic Middle East intervention in decades. <laughs> the provinces of Homs and Hama were the main Russian focus, aiming at ISIL positions, while Syria's army launched an assault in the Takia province. Although Russia claims not to have targeted civilian areas, video posted online by activists shows what they claim are casualties in Homs. A spokesperson for the Western-backed Syrian political opposition says 36 people were killed. All those districts were fighting against Daesh and defeated ISIL and the, the other extreme groups a year ago. All the casualties, unfortunately, are civilians. Uh, including one from the White Helmet and five children. Russian military video has been released claiming to show the destruction of an ISIL command post. Activists have counterclaimed that the area is controlled by the Free Syrian Army. President Putin told the UN that it would be a mistake not to cooperate with Syrian President Bashar Assad, saying he's the only one fighting ISIS in Syria. The White House doubts whether these airstrikes are only against jihadist groups such as ISIS. Russia's envoy to the EU, Vladimir Shishov, spoke to my colleague, Fariba Madvedat. Russia's unprecedented military operation in Syria have raised eyebrows for their intensity, if not for the chosen targets. There are many questions left unanswered, but I hope my guest in the studio, Vladimir Chizhov, the Russian ambassador to the European Union, will answer. Now, sir, uh, what are the intentions of Russia in Syria? Russia intends to, uh, to engage in combating the uh, terrorist threat emanating from ISIL or Daesh, whatever you call it, and affiliated terrorist organizations. Uh, Russia uh, is not only assisting uh, the Syrian army, there are over 2,000 Russian citizens and those of other CIS countries uh, fighting in Syria on the side of the terrorists. So we don't want those uh, people to to gain victory and then come back. But why now, after four years of unrest in Syria? Well, uh, I think the situation uh, has now become uh, quite uh, dangerous, not only for Syria, for the whole uh, region of the Middle East. We felt we needed to act in full conformity with international law. Yes, but the Russian military presence is absolutely staggering. I have some points here to written down. 20 ground attack jets, tanks, armored personnel, carriers, cutting edge military equipment. Is it the Third World War? Uh, it's not the Third World War, but, uh, well, Russia's presence compared to the presence of other countries in uh, adjoining countries of the region uh, is not that huge. Is it possible that Russia uh, wants to uh, keep a foothold in the Middle East in the future? It's not uh, an issue of creating some sort of uh, a foothold specifically, but uh, we uh, will certainly continue to be present on the Middle East scene, both in diplomatic terms, uh, terms uh, in political terms, and if needed, on the basis of international law in military terms as well. So does it mean that once the military operations are over, you shall leave Syria? I don't know how long this operation will last. 
but when there is no longer need for Russian military presence, of course, we have uh, other uh, ways of spending our military budget. When is it that there's no need? When uh, there, uh, the terrorist threat is eliminated and there is uh, peace and stability. There have been loud voices in the Western media about Russia not targeting actually ISIL, but starting with those rebel groups who fight against uh, President Assad's regime. The groups that the Russian military has been targeting are ISIL and ISIL connected terrorist formations, including, for example, Jabhat al Nusra. How are you dealing with the military operations of America, not to mention France in Syria? We are keeping each other informed. Have you started a parallel political process to end the, the, the problem, the crisis? Uh, actually, the political process should be a Syrian owned political process as agreed by all the major powers back in Geneva in 2012. We are not, uh, have not undertaken the role of a mediator. We are providing a venue, we are facilitating for them to talk directly to each other. Your Excellency, thank you. Thank you. Divisions inside the EU remain after the decision to relocate 120,000 migrants across the bloc. Slovakia wants to challenge this decision in court, while the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban asked about global quotas, saying that Europe cannot carry the burden by itself. As the world faces its worst refugee crisis since the Second World War, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has convened a meeting on migration and refugee movements on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Mr Ban called for an end to prejudice and scaremongering and demanded greater diplomatic efforts to end the war in Syria. Hungary has been in the spotlight as thousands of asylum seekers have poured across its borders. At the Hungarian borders, they are coming from Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan and most recently from the sub-Saharan region. Let me make it absolutely clear, Europe will not be able to carry this burden on her own. If there is no change in the current trend, Europe will be destabilized. Turkey's border with Syria is alive with people fleeing the conflict. The total number of Syrians in Turkey is now over 2 million. In camps we are hosting close to 260,000 Syrians. In some Turkish cities, on the border, now Syrians are more than Turks. In Kilis, for example, we have the percentage of Syrians are 54 percent, and Turks became minority. Despite the general concern, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Gutierrez, has called for $4 billion to deal with the crisis. So far, only 40 percent of the total has been reached. The European Commission this week unveiled its latest survey on discrimination, with some pretty ugly findings. It appears to show a growing level of intolerance in Europe towards people of a different ethnic origin or religion. Take a look at this report. More Europeans believe racism is a problem in society, according to an EU report. The views of 28,000 people formed the basis of the survey. It found that 64% of those quizzed believe discrimination based on ethnic origin is widespread. That's eight percentage points higher than when the same study was conducted in 2012. So is Europe becoming more intolerant? Franz Timmermans is the first vice president of the European Commission. It's always more intolerant when there's a crisis. It's part of our history, and we must learn from this history and be aware of this intolerance. We must combat intolerance because the survival of Europe's society depends on our ability to live together with different cultures and different religions. The same survey found only 61% of respondents said they would be fully comfortable with a colleague at work being Muslim. And finally, on to another kind of discrimination in Europe. 
Now, UN conventions say disabled people should have the same rights as everyone else. But many argue that this isn't happening. A group of protesters came to Brussels to make their voices heard and demonstrate outside the EU institutions. Hundreds of people with disabilities have protested outside the EU institutions in Brussels. The protest was organized by the European Network on Independent Living. It wants to make European decision makers aware of the obstacles disabled people face on a daily basis. The situation is quite different from one country to another. For example, here in Belgium we have waiting lists to have right on personal assistance. In other countries it even doesn't exist. They don't have personal assistance budgets. The protesters argue they should be able to attend the same mainstream schools as able-bodied people. She was explaining to me, you know, uh, you can't go to school. Since today you can't go to school because you are disabled. It's my basic human rights to education and I'm declaimed from it just because I'm disabled. Research has shown that we are the hardest hit in, in society and because we're the lowest fruit to pick off the tree. It's not acceptable and we need to stop it now. According to a 2012 report from the European Foundation Centre, more than one out of five people with disabilities are at risk of poverty in the EU. Now let's take a look at next week's agenda. On Monday, the president of Turkey will meet the heads of the EU institutions in Brussels. That same day, Eurozone finance ministers meet in Luxembourg to discuss the next steps of the third bailout program for Greece. On Wednesday, the European Parliament welcomes some high-ranking guests. The King of Spain will address parliamentarians, as well as the leaders of France and Germany. On Thursday, there will be a summit held between EU and Western Balkan leaders to discuss the migration crisis. That's all for now. Thanks very much for watching.